And uh, just a little shout out to my social location. Um, I'm a biracial Korean and white woman. I grew up outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, I am a settler on the land of the Ohlone people here in the Bay Area. I live about 25 minutes from Michael Eubanks. I am married. My anniversary is June 1st. I'll be married for 13 years. I am a cis hetero woman in a hetero marriage. Um, no kids by choice. And I like to um, mention that because uh, there are not enough people celebrating Christian women not making babies, but I'm here to represent for that squad. No babies on purpose, and I love my life. So, especially during shelter in place. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm privileged in that I'm college educated and graduate school educated, and uh, I am able bodied. I have a white parent. Um, I also live on the margins in that I am an Asian American woman pastor, and Christianity is one white patriarchal hoedown in which I am entrenched. So, and no diss on, you know, people who have babies. I'm just saying, there's a lot of spokespeople for having babies in Christianity. I'm a spokesperson for not. <laughs> so I get to talk about imagining a new way forward. And that's fantastic. That is an exciting thing to uh, talk about. So I'm actually going to share my screen because I have slides because I'm super duper advanced. So... Alrighty, and here we go. Give me a thumbs up if you're good on seeing that blank slide that I've given you. Excellent. All right, so as we are talking about imagining a new way forward, a scripture that I have been sitting with is Jeremiah 1.10. Um, it's the beginning of the prophet Jeremiah's life, and it says, See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And what I get to talk about is the to build and to plant portion. And you've had some amazing people this week, and I've been able to join you most of the week, talking about the things that need to be uprooted and torn down, the systems of empire that need to be destroyed and overthrown. So uh, things that I've heard you talk about this week that need to be uprooted, torn down, destroyed, and overthrown are empire, anti-blackness, the requirement of black blood to wipe away the sins of a white America. Sorry about that typo. A play, uh, the tearing down of anger being misunderstood. Broken relationship with Aloha Aina, where wealth is accumu accumulated by imperialism and exploitation and how we benefit from injustice. These are some of the things you've examined this week about um, what needs to be torn down, dismantled. But I get to talk about what we're imagining forward and what we get to build and to plant. And what is the new wine for new wineskins? The uh, quote that has absolutely been my meditation since this whole shelter in place season started is this one by Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, she is the author of a book called The Body is Not an Apology. And it says, we will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal, other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. Amen. Isn't that an amazing vision for what we could allow to have happen and open up in this season? So I'm going to just talk some about um, also, because I believe we should all be following Black women and their leadership towards liberation. I will plug her book, Sonia Renee Taylor, The Body is Not an Apology. You can also follow her on Instagram. Instagram, she is amazing. So let's talk about this new wine for new wineskins. We, new wine and new wineskins requires our imagination. We need to imagine bigger. That's part of why we have artists um, and creatives to help us because we need to imagine forward. I don't dream of justice for Ahmaud Arbery, though I do. I don't just dream of the end of anti-Black violence by white people in the US. I dream of a world and generations 
that don't even know what anti-blackness is, what colorism is, what white supremacy is. I dream of a world where struggle and resistance and trauma are not defining characteristics of the black experience in the United, United States. We need to imagine bigger. Yes, of course I want justice for what happened to Ahmaud Arbery, but I dream of, and I mean grieve for, dream of, a world that is so much more liberated than that, than just accountability for an evil that's already happened. We, when we say we care about justice, are imagining birthing into being a whole nother way of being humans on this earth and with one another. I don't dream of a world where COVID-19 is just contained in the Navajo Nation, and I don't just dream of a world where the numbers of missing and murdered indigenous women decreases. I dream of a world where treaties are honored and where indigenous culture and language thrives and where right relationship with the land is restored, not just for native people, but for settlers on this land willing to make costly moves for right relationship and justice as defined by indigenous peoples, not fearing loss of property and capital of our own. I don't dream of a world where women preach from the pulpit sometimes and where it's okay for queer people to come if they tamp down their queerness. I dream of a world where the church isn't based on a franchise business model. I dream of a world where churches aren't built on top down, one man, personality driven churches where rich people get nice buildings but poor folks struggle to pay the rent on their buildings every single month. I don't wanna go back to how it was. Can we imagine a world where church doesn't live by these bullshit capitalistic frameworks. And if you, you know, if you're more bothered by swearing than all that racism and capitalism, I'm not the girl for you. All social justice is science fiction. All social justice is imagining a world that does not and has not ever existed. There is a whole conversation around this online. Um, in the follow-up email, they're gonna post a blog post I did on this so that you can get to some more of the sources. But we are not talking about going back to something that was, what we are dreaming of never was. Sorry, I have to do a little check. Okay, what we are dreaming of never was. It's not about um, going back and recapturing. It's about imagining a world that we've never seen. And there's a whole conversation, Afrofuturism, indigenous futurism, science fiction. And I don't mean, I'm sorry, I will stick for, and I love nerds. I love nerd culture, but like white science fiction maintains white dreams. This still white folk in charge, Captain Picard and all your Star Trek dreams still have a super feely woman on the side and like people of color are side characters. I'm talking about science fiction as imagined by people from the margins. The idea of visionary fiction allows us to move from asking the question, what is a realistic win, which is when organizers must ask and we appreciate, but gives us room to ask, what is the world we want to live in? What is the world we want to live in? New wine requires new dreams. Don't you hear it in the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain and the call for the year of Jubilee in Leviticus 25? Dreams of a world where the poor are not on the margins of society. Can you imagine a world without prisons? Not just with like fewer people, but just like, just try. Like imagine a world where we just don't have guns. I'm not talking about like who has the rights to guns, but I just mean where there just aren't machines and instruments that exist to kill. Just to, but imagine it. And we always get to the hangups, but I mean, just imagine a world we can't, we're so hindered, but that's part. If we want to become people who 
move towards liberation and justice, we have to imagine more than just one attainable goal here and one attainable goal here, though I believe in on the ground nitty gritty organizing and labor. But I also believe that what the engine that fuels that is a dream for something so much bigger. Can you imagine a world where women can walk outside any time of day wearing whatever they want and not have to look around and be on guard to feel safe? Every time I pitch that to women, they literally can't imagine feeling safe, living in a world that doesn't accept violence and rape culture as normative and something that women are supposed to protect themselves from versus raising up men who would never violate women in that way. I think that we don't dream about the future because often the future that we're given is um, so is, is heaven. And the vision of heaven is so unimaginative. <laughs> the vision we've been given of heaven is essentially like a white suburb. And I think for most people of color, you don't want to go there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen again since I have visuals in case you forgot what our general image is. So um, one, all social justice is science fiction. This is artwork by uh, an Afrofuturist artist who I just love, love his work. Um, and I name him in a future slide. But let's remember, you know, we don't think our imaginations are a big part of of social justice because we've been told that like the greatest thing that can be imagined is apparently I don't know to me I look I see like a lot of white folks people who stay virgins forever and um I don't know like a white guy who's just sl slightly awkward and music that I'm not terribly interested in listening to and it looks boring but we need an imagination. So our vision of God is so stagnant. And what we think the future is going to be is so stagnant and uninteresting and uncreative. And I just need us to remember that God is the ultimate artist. God is the ultimate creative. Every time I need to remember this, I go and look at weird stuff in the ocean. Because I just like to remember that, and whether you believe that, I don't even care how you think all this stuff came to be, it evolved there or God spoke it into existence instantly. Either way, it all came into existence out of the imagination of God. And I just feel like this God is creative and weird and hilarious <laughs> and is putting all these things in the ocean, many things of which we barely have discovered because God is infinitely creative. And I think the other thing that hinders us about this is because um, we have a stagnant view of God. We have a stagnant view of the future we're headed towards, and we have a stagnant view of theology. We believe that theology is just, you know, uh, we have this weird cognitive dissonance where God is all knowing and is outside the bounds of time and is so creative, but also God is summed up in 12 tenets that you can agree to that are on one piece of paper that you signed when you were 12 years old and got baptized, and it's never going to change. And that is a ridiculous approach to theology, to think that we could encapsulate the living creator God in these little tiny tenets, and yet we live with that cognitive dissonance, right? Or that I ask people who've gone to church their whole lives, and I'm like, what is the significance of the cross? And they will say to me the exact same thing that someone in second or third grade will say. Jesus died for my sins. He paid for our sins on the cross. Now, yeah, that's true. But if we think that, that is one of the most important moments in all of theological history and in the history of humanity, then won't our understanding of it expand and grow and be dynamic and be able to hold so much more as we know more about God and experience more of the world? And so new wine and new wineskins require new theology. Theology is an ongoing and dynamic relationship with God, not a sense of 10 or 12 stagnant things that you can agree to in fifth grade. So let's let's get our imaginations can go so much further and the world we're imagining uh, with God can be so much more beautiful if we liberate our picture of the future of heaven, of God, and of theology. 
So I just want to um, throw out a few principles that I think that are good for us as people who are moving towards justice. But what I want to say is take time to dream because the work of justice is grinding and you face so much injustice on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're really trying to dismantle these systems, it, it, it will cause trauma. But if we imagine together, collectively, these are not individualistic dreams, so don't try to go into that little American individualistic version of uh, dream. It's a collective dream that we have. Um, there, it can give us so much hope about what we're moving to, and it will change the way that we move towards justice. So let me just share a couple of principles for us in this work. And uh, all right, so here's a couple of principles for the work. This is a mural by one of my favorite artists, L. Mack and Retina. This is a mural in LA. One, artists are critical to the work of justice. They stir the imagination of a world yet unseen. I think often um, right now there's a culture of like justice means that you can clap back at people in, you know, 120 characters or less. Justice is about so much more. And our artists are singers, poetry, music, visual artists. And I mean, be, and creatives on, on so many levels help us stir our souls towards beyond what is to what could be. Our healers. This is another piece by Kaylin Michael, the Afrofuturist. Radical, sweeping, visionary work is lived into through concrete, specific, and unglamorous labor. So yes, we have to collectively dream so big and then also never be too good for the nitty gritty of laboring for it. I think sometimes we think it goes, you know, there's like the people who are really practical and will, you know, call their representative. And then there's the people who want it to just be aspirational. And we have to do both. We have to be people who do both. This is a, 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 a piece um, in a blog that was talking about indigenous futurism. I just love this quote, so I had to share it with you. Everyday in indigenous futurism allows for everyday indigenous peoples to restore their beings, bodies, genders, sexuality, and reproductive lives from colonial institutions, projecting decolonial love and kinship into the cosmos. Tell me that isn't a beautiful phrase. Decolonial love and kinship. I'm gonna get me some of that decolonial love up in these streets. And I'll make sure that people have the tags to the blog post where this stuff was found in your follow-up email so that you guys can, can uh, uh, but uh, off of that, we follow the dreams and imaginations of those who are most impacted by broken systems. So, and it is a collective work. So I think often in our individualistic society, we're like, oh, what's my dream? Like, what do I wanna see happen? But very often that plops us right into a very individualistic approach to justice, a savior oriented, hero oriented approach. The people who are most marginalized, it is their visions of liberation that we follow. And I think for privileged people, uh, for white folks, for men, every like racial liber like space that's about racial liberation is chock full of patriarchy. All these spaces that are about helping the poor is often chock full of white supremacy. We need to decolonize our dreams and imaginations. It's, that's a work as well in the new wine and the new wine skin. So I've mentioned this, but dreams of liberation are not about individuals doing whatever they want, whenever they want. It is a deep and radical commitment and responsibility to each other and creation to right relationship and responsibilities to the image of God in all our relatives. Our practices on the way to justice must embody our values. So what I will say about that is our practices cannot be anchored in patriarchy, exploiting the labor of women of color, they can't be anchored in workaholism and in nostalgia for, I mean, the civil rights movement was amazing, but it, was, it had a lot of problematic patriarchal dynamics and the role of women, black women was erased very many times in the telling, similar with the 
farm workers movement. And so we don't want a nostalgia even for previous justice movements. Our imagination needs to be even for moving into liberation in new ways. We, uh, our practices, uh, to me, particularly for people of color, we've been told that we're supposed to martyr our mental and emotional well-being on the sake, for the sake of the cause. And I don't believe that. Uh, ministries like the NAP ministry, uh, ministries like the body is not an apology, ministries like the space I'm trying to create with Liberated Together say that our joy right now and our wholeness now is part of justice. And that uh, we will embrace those types of practices even on our way to a giant dream. And lastly, we continue to learn and grow. We never arrive. We just have to be people characterized by humility. So those are some practices and um, I'm gonna pause there. Um, oh, I did reference the NAP ministry. Uh, you can follow them on Instagram. Um, how we do the work is as important as the work we are trying to achieve. And the last thing I'll say is we have to reject at all turns any approach to justice that treats anybody as if they are disposable. We're not taking existing hierarchies and just moving around who's at the top. We're changing the frameworks completely. I did not have a lot of role models. And what I want to acknowledge is that the majority of my role models were black folks and the majority of my role models are black women, particularly for being a woman in the pulpit. And for that, I am indebted, grateful. Um, I wanna just share, a t th this feels like such an un-Asian American woman thing to do, but I wanna share a little bit of the way things, the work that I do, because I want a gift to part anybody here, but particularly to any Asian American woman that is in this space, I wanna give to, to you my own, life and what I've imagined into being in my own life so that you can go further than me, so that you can see yourself as a, as a justice leader further than me. So I actually pulled a few things from a seminar I did yesterday on anti-Asian racism um, because I just, because I didn't ever see Asian American, and most of the places I go, I am one of the only Asian American folks. Um, this is Urbana, where you guys saw that scripture from, that, or that song from, that's me with Brandy. Um, and this was an important moment for me as an Asian American person to say, I will be a part of speaking up about the movement for Black Lives. And when I went mm -hmm. to Ferguson, I almost never saw Asian American folks there. But I wanna say, even though people don't always know how to make room for us, get there. This is just a thing that a group of Asian American women and I did in response to this conference that had only white dude speakers and like one black dude. And so we were like, how about a conference with all Asian American women speakers and one happy white guy in the corner? <laughs> Trying to help people imagine the pulpit differently. I mean, how many of y'all have even heard an Asian American woman speak from the pulpit of your church? Y'all missing out on a blessing. Uh, this is me with Randy Woodley uh, receiving my degree and um, I think, to, again, I don't know how many role models of Asian American women in indigenous spaces there were, but go, be there, go further. Take, let's make the conversations complex. This is me at the predominantly black church where I minister, where we celebrate and are centered in black liberation and womanist theology all day, every day. And I'm here for it and it brings me life. And this is a serving communion at the border in El Paso. And then lastly, this is the space liberated together. I share that because I had never even had images of Asian American women in these types of spaces doing this kind of work. I don't have, I'm not gonna give a whole, how did I get, but I just wanna say, so y'all, beautiful next generation, please take it so much further than me. Please take it further and let's be courageous. I have to fight to be courageous every day. 